Welcome to the DevReady Podcast, where we're helping non-techs build better tech. Today we have Paul Langer joining us, 30-year veteran in the private equity space, built several businesses, exited some so not so successful as well, Paul, that I'm sure we'll get into a little bit today, but been involved in a number of different areas in terms of growth strategy, how to build a business to exit. And today we wanted to talk to Paul about setting up your business from the get-go, from an exit perspective. So, or what that might mean, or is it from an investment perspective? So, Paul, thanks for joining us, and uh, thanks for coming on the Dev Ready Podcast. Thanks very much for having me. Pleasure to be here. I really appreciate it. So, let's just explore a little bit about who Paul is, and uh, what your background is, and how you stumbled into private equity investment in that industry, and yeah, what's a bit about your background history? I did actually almost pretty much stumble into private equity. I had <laughs> I had two jobs in my life, and I used to say that I've been unemployable for thirty years. But then my wife pointed out if I keep saying that, then people won't won't hire me for anything. So <laughs> the reality is, after those two jobs, though, I've been either building and, and scaling and exiting yes. businesses of my own, or helping other people do the same. And uh, as you mentioned, there have been quite a number which I really shouldn't have found their way off the back of a napkin, let alone ever be registered. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've all been there in some capacity, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, we, we call that the you know, entrepreneurial R&D, you know. So yes, yes. it's just we, don't, we just don't get a government grant for it. So my first two jobs were in, or my first and only two jobs were in hospitality. And um, during and the second one was I went to this uh, hospitality venue and they were doing 500 Deutschmark a day at the bar. And I converted that in two years, two and a half uh-huh. years to 15,000 Deutschmark a day. So I had a bit of a... What's well, a touch of a touch of an increase there? It was, wasn't it? You know, <laughs> this is mid to late 80s. Mm. So people sort of like, you know, okay, you, you got a bit of a talent. And during that, I started my first business, which was also in hospitality. It was a cocktail party service. And I had, um, okay. without really realizing it in the beginning, I had a bit of a mentor and he was the founder of a German investment bank. And one day mm-hmm. he said to me, you know, Paul, you should come and work with me. I'm like, mm-hmm. Hans, you know, I got no clue what you do apart from work with money. It's, and what would I do? He says, don't worry, I'll teach you. And I said, well, I got this other little business over here that you've been helping me with. And he says, don't worry, I'll help you with that. And okay, um, nice. he said, yeah, because you'll need your money to come into this because he wanted to start a, a new boutique private equity venture capital firm with him and five of his buddies, a whole bunch of uh, high net worth. So that's how I stumbled into PE and VC. That was interesting. 30 years ago. Through your mentor in that space and then. Did he basically get you to buy into that or what was the process there? Yeah, well, when he said, listen, you know, I'll help you sell it, he actually said, listen, you're going to need money to come in as a full partner. I want you to come as a full partner. Uh You know, I'm I'm a mid-20 Aussie in Germany at the time. I'm like, well, Mm -hmm. how much do I need? And he's like, you're going to need at least 12 million Deutschmark. (laughs) (laughs) You know. It's a small amount of money. (laughs) After I stopped laughing hilariously. He's like, don't worry, I'll help you. So he taught me how to do a managed bot management buyout, which is what we did with, okay. with the business. And indeed, we got that plus more. So I was able to go away and have a bit of a holiday and go whoopee prior to starting the new gig. And so I became a full partner in in that business. And we what so we did is a multi million dollar business in that first instance, really, basically. Yeah, I mean, we were capitalized. Yeah. You can imagine six guys putting twelve million. You know, we were capitalized at seventy two mil. Yeah. Deutschmark, okay, convert well, that to US okay. dollars. It was around about 40 yes, mil yes. US at the time. So that, was, that wasn't too bad for a little boutique firm back in the late 80s, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Clearly not in the late 80s. Yeah. That's a lot of money back then. And uh, <laughs> you know, starting off that way. It was, you know, and these guys, they've been around the traps for a long time. Plus, they also introduced me to their relationships of high net worth and ultra high net worth, who I've then maintained over the many years. Okay. And when we exited that firm, see, one of the things I did in those – that in that business is I would work with the companies that we buy to help them grow and scale, work with the management mm-hmm. team. And when we exited that business, some of the high net worth came to me and said, Paul, listen, would you like to go and keep doing for us what you used to do for all of us when you know you had that business? Mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah, sure. Why not? So that's, that's just growing. And okay. these days, yeah. I, ironically, these days I deal mostly with the, uh, the children or grandchildren of those contacts because uh, some of them already passed on and the rest of them are just enjoying life. Oh, well. Yep. It has been 30 years. It's been a nice uh, career that you established there. And I imagine, yeah, that would have been at 20, mid 20s, were you? When that happened? Mid to late 20s, you said? Yeah, I was mid 20s and they were like yeah. mid 50s yeah. to mid 60s. So you, you can imagine some of them are you know, passed on and mm-hmm. the rest are yes. probably in lockdown what, somewhere right now. <laughs> yeah. What did that experience teach you? Because that would have been walking into 
some high net worth, obviously, but also people that have been around for quite a while in business and in industry. Lots of experience what there. What was that experience like? It was, in the first instance, it was very surreal because I'd come from, you know, I, yeah, I graduated uh, Australian in high school, got my HSC, got uh, declined by the Australian Air Force because my eyesight, so I couldn't fly fighters. Okay. <laughs> Too pilot. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to be a pilot. They, they offered me transport. And I'm like, you've got to be joking. I'm not going to fly C-130s. I wanted Top Gun, you know. Give me the F-111s, <laughs> yeah. which was at the time, right? That's the real stuff, right? That yeah. Me to you. And then I head off to Germany and I oh, I head off and they, I get involved in hospitality and I get involved in the high-end hospitality. So I'm getting used to this money life, but I was not. Yes. Pre- I was absolutely not prepared for what I saw, nor, was, nor even through having the first business was I prepared <laughs> for understanding how business – these guys obviously had, you know, decades of experience yeah. in buying businesses yeah. and running and all the rest. And they, and so they, they laid it all out for me. They firstly taught me about okay. how, about business structures. They taught me about how to structure, how to not, not just in terms of operationally, but how to structure a business from the start. They quite, quite frankly, all the stuff that we hear these days from some of the most inspirational speakers about business. Mm-hmm. These guys were saying back in the 80s based on how they were doing stuff. So they were talking about hiring on values. They were talking about setting things up with a purpose. They were talking about understanding that, you know, before you get into something, you've got to have your exits planned out. And this is to understand the you know, context. So well ahead of their time, basically. Oh, very much so. You know, because especially because you have to remember they were, they were generational money, you know, old, mm-hmm. very old generational money, which you wouldn't expect to be talking that way. Correct. Or I didn't anyway. So mm. it was very, I literally fell upstairs by being given this opportunity. And I'm very grateful I was. So I went from being someone who had this little business to someone who had clearly a business that was bigger than I thought. So I was able to exit yes. to move into another business where I was now suddenly responsible for analyzing the opportunities that were being presented to this multi million dollar fund and then making choices to putting recommendations to. The, to- the whole board about where we should or shouldn't be putting our money. And then they would then oh, take wow. what I recommended and they'd dissect it. In the beginning, it was quite painful because... Mm-hmm. <laughs> because... <laughs> <laughs> that section would have been a fun time. <laughs> oh, I tell you, you know, here's me thinking, you, know, yeah. you get these delusions of grandeur sort of thing. You know, you're a young bloke. Yes. You've got a picture. You're a young bloke, mid-20s. You suddenly got all this money and suddenly you're in this position like, wow, you know, and, and your head swells. You know, mine did. Mm. I'll, I'll be honest. Oh, I think anyone in that position would. That's yeah. actually been, yeah, that sort of buyer and then brought, brought into a situation like that. Yeah, I imagine it would be very difficult not to swell in that situation. You suddenly think that you're, you get this idea that you're better than you are. And then, but they had a very nice way of, you know, bringing me back down to, back to, to earth. earth. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> I could like it. In a very educational way, because they, their intent, they, they didn't bring me in there to, mm. they brought me in there to be part of it. So they didn't want to have me. Mm. Decimated. I learned, I learned how to think. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Um, and so over the years of us doing that and then over the, and subsequent years when I was helping other companies and other investors, there was this framework we used for evaluating whether a business would be something we get into or not. And quite frankly, it's the same framework that every business owner should use. In my yes. opinion, should. I don't like using that word too often, but really should use to assess where they are and where they're going, you know. And one thing to, I need to point out as well, unlike a lot of VCs and PE companies out there, yes. these guys, they don't, if they like something, they'll go and they'll introduce themselves and they'll say, hey, we're interested, put together a deck mm-hmm. and, and, and let's have a chat. They don't, okay. they're not like a lot of other people who are open to receiving pitch decks all the time. In other words, they don't go looking for it. If they are interested in it, they'll find it. So because oh, so they're actually physically hunting on industries and businesses out there and people well, just, probably because you mentioned something around hiring on value. So imagine they care about the people too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So they, they've got the ear to the ground and talking to, to their connections all the time to understand what's happening in, in particular markets when they're, you know, they go in and out of different markets. So like we don't all eat in the Chinese or the Greek or the Italian restaurant every night. Mm-hmm. So just in the same yes. way, they, they diversify their investments. They don't really, uh, well, sorry, let me rephrase that. They rarely invest in something that has come as a pitch from out of nowhere. Their investments, mm-hmm. I would say over 99% of the ones I've seen are, they've said, hey, we like this, let's investigate. And then they'll put their time and effort into it. And there's a message in there because most people I talk to who want funding quite, mm-hmm. and this, this is me as a 30 year of PE guy, right? I tell most yeah. people, mm-hmm. how about you try selling your way out of your funding issues? How about, how about 
<laughs> How about you actually go and it's a great way to look around. at it? Yes, bootstrapping, yeah. right? Doing yeah, yourself. well, yeah, go and demonstrate that you can actually sell what you say you're going to sell. And mm. to be honest, the tech bubble of the uh, of the '90s has a lot to answer for in that. Yes, yes. People, you know, and it still goes on today. It's oh, there's a new bubble, bubble in that tech, tech space, space these days, all that like crypto space, space, but it's another another story. Oh yeah, oh yeah, big time. <laughs> we'll we'll see where bubble. that one goes. You've got valuations of company multi billion dollar valuations and multi million. You're thinking, what are they doing? How will they have this value? It's all spec, the whole thing. It is, and when <laughs> when that and quantitative easing blow up in our faces, then you know there'll be there'll be some winners and there'll be some losers. There always are. And it's always is, yes. My, I guess my point there is this that. A lot of the time, if you do the things that you need to do to be attractive to an investor, you'll have a successful business and then bringing investment on board will put you in a stronger position than if you go after investment really when you are in that bootstrapping shoestring yes, sort of state yes. because you're going and to be no giving- position of power there either, is there? So you've no. got no leverage when you haven't proven or even delivered anything. So I think, and you mentioned around hiring then I think I'm just still going back to that hiring on value, but also yeah, hiring on results or investing on results is a lot easier for people to put their money towards, isn't it? Absolutely. And especially these days, right? In the current current climate, there yeah. is just so much out there. It's the, the market is just saturated with possibilities. It doesn't matter which industry you're in. I was talking to a mate of mine in the hospitality industry in Australia. Mm-hmm. He's like, I have 200 Sydney top Sydney footprints you could walk into tomorrow mm-hmm. fully equipped and just start up no money down, right? You wouldn't have no to money put a down. penny in there. <laughs> but, but, but who would do that in this climate? Right? Yeah, I know. Yeah, the climate is yeah not very good for that, but still that tells you why that opportunity opportunity exists as well. Yeah, correct. So anyway, so I was, I was just saying, we, you know, we have this framework and it's, it's, it's three, three primary categories. The first is around minimizing risk. Uh, second is about taking money. And the yep. third is about making it happen. And so the first is really about about money, about reward, about purpose, about all those things. And I'll get in, I'll, I'll I'll dive into these really a bit deeper in a second. And the second one <laughs> is all about the the mechanisms, and the third one is all about people. So okay. let's let's maybe start with minimizing my risk. And this is again, yeah, let's dig into that. Yeah, this is again how how the PE investors. I've worked with and how we worked, mm-hmm. look at it. And I suggest to any business owner out there, if you look at it from the same perspective, you'll be very well positioned to build a mm-hmm. very successful business and attract investment at the time when it's- Yeah, looking forward to digging in on this because clearly there's a lot of experience and yeah, big money so, investment behind this strategy. So yeah, let's let's dig in. So okay. minimizing risk. So cool. So the first one is the same radio station everyone tunes into, WIIFM, what's in it for me? And mm-hmm. although that sounds terribly- <laughs> Yes. I love it. That sounds terribly material and it can be to a degree because, you know, what's in it for me, how much money is going to be and all the rest of it. But just remember oh. that it doesn't always have to be a monetary thing. It can be purpose. It can be values. It can be satisfaction. It could be fulfillment. It could be a whole bunch of things. And when you, whether you're talking to an investor or you're thinking about your business yourself, what is really in your business for you? And money is really the last thing. And I know a lot of people say that and a lot of other people raise their eyebrows and say, oh, that's really cliche. It's not. Money will follow if you're doing something which the world needs, which you have a talent for and which you love doing. That's a pretty cool formula. Yeah, I agree with that because we sometimes find ourselves, I know that when I look at opportunities and I see count dollar signs, it generally doesn't work out too well. But when I look at how am I helping, what the value we're getting out of it, and am I actually enjoying what I'm doing? then it's a different conversation because the money comes. And then there's a different different passion that comes through that and people see that. Correct. When they approach you and talk to you about whatever it is that you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so the what's in it for me is as much about the the financial side of it as it is about the why and the purpose and and that sort of thing. So as a business owner, what really gets you out of bed every morning? Why do you get up? Mm -hmm. Why do you get up? The other one is, the next one is where's the, within minimizing risk is where's the exit? Now, that's one of the first questions we always asked ourselves, whether we bought, when we bought into a business or invest in the business, where, how are we going to get out of this? And our strategy, our strategy was, well, there'll be maybe a couple of exceptions, but I'll say all of the time okay. was we would grow the business through expansion, through acquiring other complementary assets, other complementary businesses. So it was always a case of, okay, we're going to buy this one. We're going to grow it, systemize it, and we're going to buy other things pretty quickly to plug into it. And then we're going to offer it up to the market as a different entity. So businesses these days aren't, you know, we have the approach anyway, business is not meant, is not built to last. 
Business is built to synergize and everybody will reach their own glass ceiling. And there's mm-hmm. someone on the other side of that glass ceiling who can take what you've done and take it to a whole new level. So mm-hmm. think about where, where your exit's going to be and how, and not just, oh yeah, we'll go, we'll do, we'll go IPO or someone will buy it. Yeah, really. I mean, seriously, that's as far as you're going to think. I mean, the next that's person says to me that we're going to, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I need to read more. What am I going to do? Oh, I think I'll pick up a book or a Kindle. Seriously. I mean, if that's mm-hmm. as far as you're thinking, sit down, think some more. An exit strategy is like dating. Yeah. Okay. In, okay. It's sort what of like the- by that? So you obviously know who you're selling to from the beginning or who might buy the actual, the business itself? Well, when you start dating, you don't, you know, if you say, oh, listen, I want to get married sometime. Maybe you do, maybe you yeah. don't. I don't, you know, I'm married uh-huh. 19 years, but I don't, I don't think marriage yeah. is a necessary institution these days. Nonetheless, if you want to get married or you want to have a partner for a long time, you know, you don't start out dating on the principle that the person you meet is going to be your walking down the aisle with you, do you? No. It's just more of a test engage, get an understanding of who they are. And yeah, it's a, it's a process. Correct. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's a process. And it's, it's like you, you figure out what is it you like, you know, if you, whether you're a girl or a guy or any other gender you might identify with, you determine what is it, what are the personality traits, what are the characteristics, what are the hobbies, what are the things that you like. And ideally, you're going to find someone who likes a large percentage of what you like. So you have a lot in common. And you'll start yes, dating. Yes. You'll go out for drinks and dinner and whatever it is you do. Mm-hmm. And you'll identify who those people are. In business, in setting up an exit, you, you already set up, okay, well, this is the sort of company. This is the personality of the company. This is the values of the company that we would like to, we, we think we should, we, we'd be a good target for, right? Okay. And then you, as you gradually build the build it, you know, you say, okay, well, who are the candidates for that? And then you go to get to understand who those companies are. And as you get a bit further down the track, you might start some collaborative activities with them, cross-marketing campaigns. Interesting. Whatever. Yeah, okay. We've done these things before. Um, so I'm not, um, this is not theoretical. This is actually stuff yes, that actually what you've works done. for us. So collaborative campaigns, so working in joint venture or something along those lines is a possibility before you exit. Is that what you're doing there? That's one of the things we've done, yeah. So I'll take as an example, we, we had a, a transportation business in Berlin. Yes, and we bought yes. a uh-huh. limousine company and okay. then we okay. bought a trucking company and another couple of limousine companies we plugged into the whole thing and we built up a logistics mm-hmm. business. And each business fed the, in the beginning, we started doing cross marketing for each other. We started referring clients to each other. We started talking about how we might use collective systems. Of course, we had, <laughs> unbeknownst to the other companies, we had plans and the plans were yeah, we wanted, okay. we wanted to acquire you, right? And mm-hmm. we wanted them, we wanted them to know that we were, you know, we were playing serious game and we, you know, we knew what we were talking about. So we were always taking the lead in terms of suggesting stuff. And I was like, oh yeah, great. You know, cause they were also busy just trying to run their damn business. Right. Get it. So, mm-hmm. and in that, and the, the interesting thing was most of these companies were bigger than us. So we became the tail wagon. And the you're, dog. you were lining up to acquire them in that instance. Did you just say? Yeah, correct. Okay. Interesting. I'm learning so a we, lot here, Paul. Keep going. You've yeah, so <laughs> so, been growing so, on your own. And trying to take over their market, just absorb them. Yeah, exactly. It's like the I realized the Borg was bigger than than the than the uh, Starship Enterprise, but it was the other way around. So it was it was literally tag, uh, tail wagging the dog, and it, and okay. people don't expect it, but it's very very easy to do when you know how. Mm. So where's the exit? The third one in minimizing risk is show me the money. And again, it may sound terribly material. It may sound like the what's in it for me, but it's not necessary. It's show me how this thing makes money. How does this idea, okay. how does this product or service make money? How does it, you know, and you can't actually make money. You can only take money, but how does this going to put cash in my wealth account? Because at the end of the day, an investor, irrespective of all the other stuff that they may or may not want to get into and a business owner mm-hmm. in principle should have the same approach, irrespective of all the other reasons why they're in business, one of the reasons at the end of it all is to put money into their wealth account so that they can transition out of this into either retirement or if they're, depending on where they are in their life cycle or into the next opportunity, right? Okay. So how does this thing make me money? If you don't know how it's going to generate cash flow, mm-hmm. that's going to put cash into your wealth account, then why are you- Why are you, doing, why are you in business? In business, that yeah. way. So yeah, yeah in reality, it's- it's, a tra- it's in the end, yes, you're delivering value, delivering service, but yeah, you need to be monetized and that is the ret- return value, basically. Correct. Even if you're an NGO, I mean, let's, let's be honest, NGOs need, need fiat currency to be able to go and 
do the work that they, they want to go operating. and do. That's right. So that's lifeblood. So what's in it for me? Where's the exit? Show me the money. All these three, these three things for, a, for an investor minimize the risk. Mm-hmm. And quite yes. frankly, they should be the questions that the business owner should be asking themselves when they start a business or when they're looking to take stock of where they are. Can I go back to your exit? Because I want to get some clarity there. Now, you're talking about acquiring as a part of your exit. That's obviously building your business. But then you mentioned you were potentially partnering, cross-marketing, then acquiring these businesses. But that's obviously growing your business and the value. And then do you have a certain – the exit itself, was that selling to somebody else? How did you structure that part of it? Because I didn't quite get that. Oh yeah, good point. Yeah, good point. So no, indeed, you're absolutely right. So that's um, yeah. we you grow. We do a little bit of dating, the, the the collaboration stuff. Then we'd acquire them, we'd assimilate yes. them into our structures, our systems, yes. and yes. under a single brand or a under a okay. single banner, and then we'd offer that to excuse me, we'd offer that to the market to a bigger player. Okay. All right. Okay. So. Yeah. Over time, I've been pitched to and I've pitched. Mm-hmm. I've been both in terms of investment and in terms of selling. It's the same okay. process. Mm-hmm. All right. So, so yes, like, our, where our are we selling to corporate entities? What's the target there? Where does it sort of land? When we're in the mm-hmm. travel uh, and uh, accommodation industry, one mm-hmm. of the things there we sold, we, we built up a series of boutique B&Bs. This is well okay. before Airbnb. Okay. We didn't have anywhere near the market value of Airbnb. <laughs> But we, yes. we built up a boutique Airbnb thing in South Germany uh-huh. and we sold that to one of the bigger chains who we knew were looking for a high-end offering for their club clients. Okay, interesting. And how do you find out this information? Do you get to know them as well? You get do to you know them. You know, with them? Yeah. Yeah. When you're in the industry, what you do is mm-hmm. you, you know, you're you networking naturally and you, you, have, mm-hmm. you have staff and you have your team and you build up the structure so that it can be you know, feedback through the business and you put out the feelers through mm-hmm. the business to find out you know what people are interested in and okay. what's happening in the marketplace. So then you're structuring your business for the marketplace to serve and solve problems, basically. Yeah, correct. For the buyout, not just the yeah, customer. customer. Future, very interesting insight. Future there. customer, <laughs> effectively. Mm. <laughs> and yeah. then you're very growing not through slow growth and trying to take over the market is just absorb the other, buy another business or absorb them so you can then take their market share with you. Mm. Correct. Correct. Now, I'm going to ask more questions because I'm very intrigued here. Acquisition strategies, like how, what sort of approaches did you utilize there in that, in that instance? Was it cash buyouts? Was it, how did you generally do that? Because there's a number of acquisition strategies. I'm not going to profess to be an expert in that space, but I'd love to hear some of the different options that you have in this space. As whenever possible, and this sounds a lot of people might say, "Oh, this sounds terrible." Right? Yes. <laughs> when, whenever possible, we will put a, the smallest amount of money on the table. Okay. Okay. Biggest. Our main strategy was a form of vendor finance. So we put some money on the table, mm-hmm. and we would buy the asset through the growth that we created. We'd already demonstrated. See, yep. the interesting thing is, by through the collaboration, we'd already demonstrated our ability to help them yes. grow their business. Yes. And help them grow their uh-huh. rev. And okay. so when we come along and say, listen, what we'd like to do is we'd like to bring your business into ours and then you know, grow it together. We'd already proven ourselves. Yeah, that makes sense because you're helping them sell and grow their revenue already. So that, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. And then, of course, if they don't like the idea, it's okay. You know, and it's not, we don't, we wouldn't make threats or anything. It's okay. You know, they, they weren't the only business that we were looking at and we could go to other businesses and do the same thing because we were going to help other people grow. So okay. it was like, oh, okay. So it's that psychology of the takeaway, right? Like, <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. Oh, you you've been helping us. You bring grow. your business in. Yeah. Get it. If you take it away from them, they're yeah, really we, yeah, you know, we've, we've we've been helping, we've been collaborating, we've been, you guys have been making some good money. Now we want to go and do this. Oh, well, how about we just keep going and doing that? Is was sometimes the response was, yeah, we can do that. So, but really, what we want to do is we want to grow this asset for a bigger exit, and we want we'd love you guys to be part of that. Okay. If you don't want to be part of that, then you know there are other companies that we can we can approach who we've also worked with who would want to be part of that. Mm-hmm. So they would get a bit of money down and then ownership in the bigger business. Is that the one? Yes, they would. Interesting. So basically, you're offering to acquire these businesses, bring them in under the the bigger brand, which is obviously your brand, giving them maybe a little bit of buy it plus equity. Is that the model that you're going with here? Yeah, correct. So you know, we uh-huh. 
it was very rare that we'd throw, you know, a lot of cash at someone and say, you know, that's it, get out of there. What would you consider a lot of cash in your world? All right. Yeah. It depends on the deal, obviously. I hate to answer that question yeah. so vaguely, but it yeah. can be, let's say it's an acquisition of a small acquisition of say 10, 15 mil, then yeah. we wouldn't go higher than, you know, six to nine. Okay. okay. And the equity would be based on five year value. Okay. okay. All right. Yeah. This bit talking, that's small. Yeah. They get it. That's fine. But right. yeah. for some of our listeners, this might be big, but yes. But I think just to bring this down to the context of what we're doing, I think this is, why we've got Paul on is to really get a gauge on if you're going to be in business and want to invest in business, starting from this position, I think it gives a bit of context. Even if you're looking at a lot smaller numbers, it gives you a bit more strategy to start thinking like a business and an investor rather than just a business owner or an employee within your own business. So be that's why we're going through this process with Paul. So yeah, be investable. We'll get back to where Now learn the acquisition approach. Yeah. And just, just to qualify, mate, and you're absolutely yeah. right. So, the biggest stuff we ever got involved with had an exit of the biggest one ever had uh, was an exit of three fifty million euros. The smallest, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean that's I mean, no, they're nice things to talk about, but they don't happen every yeah. day. The smaller end of stuff, you know, sometimes we'll do the yeah. two fifty to one yeah. and a half mil, which is probably maybe more around the area that some of the people listening to this might be thinking yes. of. Mm-hmm. And the the simple thing is this: though. the principles that we're talking about today but are the same. To you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly the same. It's just a question of mm-hmm. size and scale. If you can Correct. do it, you know, Miyamoto Masashi, I believe it was, the, the, the Japanese samurai with Book of Five Rings. I think it was him who said that uh, it was either him or Lao Tzu. It was, uh, you know, it's know how to kill one man. It's know how to kill 10,000. Mm. And it's the same principle in business. If you know how to yeah, do it for 100,000, you can do it for 100 million. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's only extra few zeros when you think about it, but I think it's just more of a, a mindset thinking it gets to that scale, really. Totally. It is. That's that's where it is 100%. And when you awaken to that new mindset, you will not go back and yeah, you will it. just keep going and going bigger and bigger. But you ask someone who's made 10 million, their next target's mm-hmm. 100 million. You ask someone who's made 100 million, the next target is half a billion or a billion. Yes. It's always increasing, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yep. Before so we, we get... always want to grow and expand as people. Too far away from that. What sort of time scale are we talking about from when you either start this business or acquire one to your exit? When we were investing, we always had a three to five year exit plan and it was majority of the time was three. So with people in business, unless you really have some deep rooted desire to be in that business generationally, mm-hmm. I suggest that a time frame of three to five years is going to be where it's at. And then look at, and by the three year mark, look at where you're going to go next. Even if you have a five-year plan by year three, okay, how am I going to start transitioning out of this? And hopefully you've already documented that in the, mm-hmm. in yeah. advance. So you'd have a guide or like say first year's first work, years. understand the, the industry or business you've moved into, start doing your partnerships and collaborations, then two to three, start the discussion start about, about the exit with the new company that you're acquired. Yeah, correct. So roughly. year one, when we invest in the business, year one was betting down, it, getting the systems and structures and, and everything right. And betting that down, year two, and, and starting to have conversations with people about possible collaborations. Year two was all about collaboration, mm-hmm. okay. uh, and yeah. year three we would start to have the conversation about whether we would acquire them or not. And by the end of year three, we'd be acquiring them. And quite often, we would once we'd done the final acquisitions and assimilated them into the systems and structures, which went pretty darn quick. Okay. The way we set it all up. We would flip that business to a bigger business. So as soon as we started the acquisition of other businesses mm-hmm. into our brand and the growth mm-hmm. of that brand, we already had that established enough to be able to go and present it to other partners who would buy us out. So it was, it was sort of a round type of round table arbitrage just over a slightly longer period of time. You know, we were, we were sitting yeah. at the table and we had yeah. people on the left who were selling us their business and we had people right. on the right who were presenting the bigger picture to. Mm-hmm. Get it. Yeah, and it's all about being structured and thinking big picture and having that plan in place because you can't operate that without a plan. So um, clearly it's starting it from the, the beginning. And anyone who says, oh, I, but I'm too small, I can't do that, I would suggest you you know, you know, need to look inside yourself and, yes. and do yes. some work there because you absolutely can. You Interesting. Absolutely yeah. can. I think it's good to putting it out there for some people that are yeah, starting out and thinking about just building a tech or a tech business, but... What are who are the partners you could collaborate with, not just from a partnership perspective to grow your business, but yeah, could you be acquiring them? 
And in terms of the money that you pay them, I'm sure that you could potentially even get finance for that. I'm not sure the structures, but there are different ways you could do this, right? Yes, absolutely. You know, we had the very fortuitous situation that we didn't need to go and get finance. We sometimes, that's yes. it, we sometimes syndicated, you know, if we wanted to yeah, spread yeah. our risk mm-hmm. across a bunch of stuff, we would sometimes syndicate with other people, other, other high mm-hmm. net worths. Yes, you could get finance. I mean, I've started a business off the, off a credit card before. Okay, I haven't like it. <laughs> I had a twenty thousand dollar limit, but and I know people have bootstrapped the business off a of grand. But mm-hmm. if you're prepared to back yourself and you're prepared to pay eighteen to twenty one percent interest on the money, and you think you yep. can grow the business in that time, even if that even if the the profits from the business are pretty much decimated by the the interest rate for the first year, mm-hmm. back yourself in that way. Mm. Go oh, yeah, and do you, it. You got to put your money where your mouth is, especially if you're going to jump into this space, and if you're going to go in. You want to be prepared and just be prepared for it's the first year or two is some hard yards, but yeah, really back yourself and give it a real good go. Totally. You know, people want to see skin in the game. If you're going to go and ask someone yes. for money, and it doesn't matter if it's an investment or a bank, if you're going to ask someone for money, they're going to want to see skin in the game. They're going to see what you've got yeah. in there. And guess what? That old concept, oh, but I've got five years or 10 years of sweat equity in it. Really? Mm. really yeah we appreciate yeah. that's why we're looking at you the time you put in but what else you got in there yeah okay get it yeah if you put in, put your own money behind it again that's even more and it's it's more conviction to the idea and the product and the business or whatever you might be doing and it shows that to the investor as well absolutely and you know what i mean i'll, I'll be the first to say God, anyone listen to this this is coming from the context of what i've done there are other businesses yeah. in the industry who have a completely opposite opinion to it than I will, right? Yeah, um, they yeah. will. They'll be people will throw money at you, yes, because they'll, they'll they'll be taking they'll be going to the races and taking a bet on number six, right, mm-hmm. without knowing what number six has done in the past. <laughs> like it, yeah. And that's some investments. They just yeah, they invest in a hundred and hope for a few winners. But yeah, and hope for a few big winners. My great auntie was a, was a professional punter back in the uh, the forties and fifties. So. Uh, <laughs> Oh, oh, nice. yeah. So moving on from minimizing risk, because yes. that's all. There's the... a lot of content there, minimizing risk, and a lot of people to probably take away and soak in, I think. So, yeah, there's a bit there. I hope I haven't over- overloaded too many people, because there's still two sections to come, and I'll probably, yeah, right. I'll probably right. have to breeze through them to make it fast. They can no, go back and listen to it a few times to understand it properly. Let's keep digging in. Okay, so, so the next one gets really more tangible, because all of that stuff we've talked about has been... Yes. Maybe less touchy feely for people. The next one is about taking money, and we—I I say very specifically taking money. Although I use the term making money before, the only people who can make money are the Reserve Bank or the Federal, you know, the Central Bank of your country. You can print it. Yes. In, yes. In Australia, the Reserve Bank at the behest of uh, of the federal government. So you can only take money and just remove the emotional negativity of the idea of taking money. So taking money is about three things, and they're all started. They all start with S. It's about okay. structures, systems, and scalability. So let's look at structures. There are two core structures. One is how do you structure your business? So and an investor is going to look for a, a structure which is going to minimize their risk, protect them the most, and have the possibility to earn them more money due to you know, tax relief and all the rest of it. And I suggest to you as a business owner, the money you spend on a good accountant, and I don't say bookkeeper, I mean an accountant, who really understands the tax law of your region, Yes. right? That money is really, really well invested, Mm -hmm. right? And you probably want to have a tax lawyer working with a tax accountant. And there are some really good ones in Australia and Sydney, right? Um, Who I know. Mm -hmm. So get the structure of your company right. And you will do two things. One is you'll, in terms of yourself, you'll increase your possibility of earning, increase the security by reducing the risk around around the business for yourself. And the second thing you'll do is you will make yourself, possibly make yourself more attractive to people who would want to invest if that situation ever arises because of how you've structured the business. It do, not only does it show that, not only does it give them an entity, they say, oh, this is, you know, this is something I can put my money into because it's already all set up. It also shows them that you've actually thought about it and that you haven't just gone down to ASIC, registered a, a PTY limited or, or got your yes. accountant or bookkeeper yes. to do the thing or whatever, <laughs> you've actually thought about the structure. You've actually thought about the, because the structure is all about the exit, right? How am I going to get out of this? And how am I going to keep the most amount of money that I can take when I get out? 
Because yeah, and I think it's well worth talking to some people who know this, and I think you mentioned tax lawyers and some proper accountants. Like you said, there are some accountants as bookkeepers, and they'll do whatever you say, and that's basically it. But yeah, getting advice up front, I'd recommend that too, because first business I structured was not quite right, but that's okay. Move on. You learn. Absolutely. So the structure. And then the second area of structure is in how are you going to structure your, your workforce and your systems mm-hmm. and all the rest of it. So a couple of ideas. Are you going to have a, a flat structure? Are you going to have hierarchy? How are you going to have clusters? Are you going to have groups? What are you going to do? How's reporting going to go? Are you going to be a bricks and mortar thing or are you going to be remote? And before, you know, six months ago, people would be like, I can't work remote. I have to have <laughs> bricks and mortar. I have to be able to hang my shingle somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, so let's change for our business too. Uh, no office anymore, no office. but yeah, it's interesting <laughs> what you yeah. learn when you're forced to. Yeah, Most you know, I, I remember when I came back to Australia, people would just, they insisted on having a face-to-face coffee. I'm like, dude, really? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I used to live in the Netherlands and I'd be meet, I'd be having coffee with people in Germany. I don't think I was going to be driving for two hours to Dusseldorf from Den Haag to, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. just to go and have a coffee. Yep. And the irony is it could take me an hour to drive from, uh, to come from where I live in Sydney to the city to just have the same coffee. So yeah, I, correct. I, I, could, I could cross borders of countries in Europe in the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Love it. So how are you going to structure yourself? How are you going to structure your work? How are people going to work? How are they going to report? Mm-hmm. And there's no right or wrong about it necessarily. Mm. It's just give some thought to it and don't just like, oh, well, we just figure it out along the way. Have some have some thought put into it. They say that the first thing to go out the window is a business plan, and it's absolutely true. Nonetheless, mm. have some framework around which you are going to use. I, I I love randomness. I love dynamic in business. And in order to be able to be random and fluid and dynamic, you need to have a structure under you on which you can always lean Stand back on. on. Mm. Mm. You know? I think it's a great point because yeah, you can be random and fluid, but if there's no structure underpinning it. It can be go all over the place. And there's no direction then. Yeah. And I think there are more and more people out there who just love to be, you know, random and ad hoc. Find someone, if if that's not, if you're not a structured person, find someone who you either employ or you partner with who is. And then if you partner with them, don't get annoyed as hell with them when they, <laughs> when they put structure towards you. And if you Two employ them. people, yes. Yeah, hey, totally right. And if you employ them, don't get ticked off by them. You're employing them for a reason. Take for that reason. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that, that value, right? Absolutely. So structure. Second one is, is systems. You know, systems come from hospitality and hospitality is, it's possibly one of the hardest things to systemize because it's so human based, real hospitality, you know, whether it's restaurants, bars, hotels or whatever, you need that human for, for we homo sapiens to, to have the feelings we have that we want to have when we engage in something like a good night out or going away on a holiday or even on a business trip, there is that, that touchy feely thing that we want. And in hospitality, if you don't get it, you have, and have a bad experience, it's like, Oh my God, really? And it's a hard thing to systemize because systemization is not just technology. It's also people. And the trouble is when you systemize things, you run the risk of, of making things too clinical and yeah, taking that personality out of it. Right. Mm-hmm. So correct. Yeah. Especially hosp- hospitality, that industry yeah, there. Yeah. You want the personality in it. Yeah. There's Absolutely. a process, process to, to wait a table and take an order and deliver that to the mm-hmm. kitchen, but yeah, you don't you want them to be robots around like a robot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And now take that. And I don't really mind which business anyone's in, take that. And how do no. I apply that in my business? And I'll go to the under end, possibly the under end of a scale of the scale. And I don't want to sound like I'm a picking on accountants today, but accountants, because <laughs> uh, I'm not. Accountants, we tend to think of accountants as these dry, and lawyers, right? We tend to think of them as these dry professionals, right? Yes. Who yes. really don't inspire us, but we love what they do when they do it really well. Right? And that's, that's yeah, very true. Very true. So, yeah, when you speak to your accountant, he saves you a bit of money at tax time because he's picked something up. Yep, that's brilliant. But yeah, we don't care about the personal the touch. It's more about the result sometimes. How would it be, you know, I'll give you an example. How would it be if you walk into an accountant's office and mm-hmm. instead of there being a receptionist there, there's this cardboard cutout which says, welcome, someone will be with you. We're glad you're here. Someone will be with you in 6.7 seconds. And you're like, yeah, really? Too much personality for the accountant, yeah. <laughs> and you look at your watch and within 6.7 seconds, someone's come from the back office and they're out the front. They say, oh, 
and they find out what you're there for. And, oh, yes, okay, well, I'll let Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so know that you're here. In the yes. meantime, can we get you something to drink? Here's our menu, right? And they'll give you a menu. Interesting. And, oh, uh, by the way, would you like to do, if you need to do some email on your, you know, or charge your phone or, you know, when you need to send a letter or you want to send a, you know, whatever, or print something, you know, all our facilities are here. There are instructions on how to connect, but if you need any help, we'd be more than happy to help you get that connected while you wait. All right. Now you wouldn't expect Service that. does not exist in that account practice. No, it actually does because that example is something I'm giving you. <laughs> but, well, I haven't seen it, that before, but anyway, obviously uh, you have. It's, <laughs> it's a very exceptional occasion. No, yeah. clearly not the same accounts. No. <laughs> or take a lawyer who doesn't charge you by the minute, but charges uh-huh. you based on value. And mm. you know, like instead of saying like every time I'm on the toilet reading your file, I'm going to bill you in six minute increments. They agree up front how much it's going to cost and you agree to the cost and that's locked in as an example. Yeah, that's, that's a nice approach. So systems come down to people as well as technology. And the idea of systems for me are two things. One is to provide a consistent quality experience for both the client and the employee. And two, to free up the employee from doing mundane tasks, not so that they can be made redundant, but so that they can go off and do things in the business that really resonate with them, that they're passionate about, and which they can excel in, and that you as the business owner can leverage to the benefit of the business based on shared values. So the, Love it. Mm. That's what systems do in my world. It's a great way to um, frame that, because some people might have the context of systems are just a dry thing, but the result is what you're focusing on there. And they're great results for both parties involved, and employees are a massive part of a business and culture, and they have also want to be served and be able to grow. So I think that's a really good framing of what a system can do. And without them in place, I'm pretty sure the, the third point is impossible. Mm-hmm. Abs- yeah, yeah, and you're absolutely right. <laughs> and just briefly on what I said there is like, a lot of people want in their business, they want their staff to give their customers and their prospect these awesome experience. They want the customers to have a great experience, yet they don't really give a damn how their employees experience it themselves. And if you if, if you adopt that approach, and we're going to get that into the making it happen shortly, Yes, then you're, you're really setting yourself up a failure. But yes, you're right. That, that last one comes into scalability. If you don't have a structure, you don't have the systems, you don't have a machine which is going to deliver awesome experiences to people with respect to whether it's a product or service and continually do that consistently. At a, you know, you go to a restaurant, you have a steak one week, it's perfectly cooked. You go back the next week, you want that same steak perfectly cooked again, don't you? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Consistency is important in anything, right? And we expect correct. it. We expect consistency as human beings. We like to be comfortable and know what we're getting ourselves into. Yeah, and scalability is, again, all about or rests upon the ability to provide a consistent service and a consistent quality of experience to mm-hmm. your prospects and to to your clients and to your staff. Scaling is going to be the one thing that is going to help you break away from the, the chains that bind you to your regional area. You know, before this whole COVID thing, people yes. would be like, oh, but my niche is North Sydney or, mm-hmm. you know, wherever. Let's just talk about Australia or Sydney. People yes. will be talking about, oh, my niche is this local area. And now suddenly they've been forced into a situation where they can't work in the local area. They have to work online. And, oh, my God, there's actually this world out there. Mm, it's yeah. opened up a few things for a lot of people, I would say. Yes. Would you say with the scalability or the structure side, at which point is the one where you would sort of step back so you can have structures without you in place or so you can scale without you in place? Sorry, can you just repeat that? So with the scalability or the structures, at one of these points, you'll have to like take a step back and the business should be able to run on its own like a well-oiled machine. Correct. Yeah. And which one would you say that would happen at most? Systems. 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 You, you, you're not going, you're not from, well, again, my experience, you're not going to get the scalability unless you are able to remove yourself from the equation. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Agree. Yeah. Scale, scaling with you at the helm, you know, uh, Lord Nelson couldn't be on every ship, but he mm-hmm. was on every ship because- of who he was and you know how he was mm-hmm. and 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 what he'd set up in in, in in terms of the systems, right? Okay. Yeah, because that would be something important for the listeners at the smaller size of the business where they generally run everything. It's understanding yeah. that yeah, you can make a structure and take yourself out of it and have it still run. You don't have to worry what are the kids doing at home when I'm not there. Yeah. With a the type of mentality. Absolutely right. 
Oh, absolutely right. And actually, it, you raise a really good point just with regard to structure because you say, you know, they, they tend to do everything. Here's a common mistake I find most small business owners make. They don't distinguish. They don't create a distinction between the different roles in the business because they are the owner. So they're the shareholder. They are the director. Yes, yes. They mm-hmm. are the manager. And they're also the janitor employee or, 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 or any other level of employee they want to be, right? Yeah, they wear all the so hats, basically. They're wearing every hat and they never take one off and put another on. They always have all four on. And the one which is quite often is most dominant is that of the employee. And that's why people end up working so-called in your business, right? Because they wear the employee hat most of the time. You need to Mm -hmm. create that distinction for yourself that you are an owner. An owner has a certain role. A shareholder has a certain role. A director has another role. An Manager has another role and an employee has another role. And it can be very difficult unless you've got a split personality or you're a multi-potentialite to be able to break those, break, put walls between the two. Nonetheless, you have to do that. The faster you learn to do that, the faster you're going to be able to bring other people into your business. Imagine that you're doing it all on your own and you bring someone else in. And there, I'm sure there are people listening to this who've done that before. They bring someone into the business and they find it really challenging to delegate. Yeah, because they've never compartmentalized for themselves what it is they do. Everything they do is a blur across all of these different roles and tasks. They've never segmented out what it is they do in each of their roles. So they have find it very challenging to delegate to other people. I think what yeah. you said there, everything's a blur. I think that's a really interesting point because you can go from one hat to the other and you don't realize that you're jumping from one process to another when you're a small business. So I think that's a really interesting point that you raised there from a blur perspective. Yeah, it, it, I see it all the time. And quite frankly, I went through it myself at one stage when I uh, yeah. was, uh, oh, I don't think we have enough time to even talk about that. But <laughs> <Yeah. we're, laughs> I've been through this myself too. And I think it's taken us time in our business to break rolls down and what the requirements are and even defining yeah what hats are and working in particular roles it's it can be challenging if you don't stop and take a step back and i think we've been doing a bit of this in different facets and opening up different angles of our business of recent so it's been anthony can attest to that from a a marketing hat that's all right but he's yeah. defining processes around that and how do you scale it and i think yeah you need to do that otherwise you get stuck and you can't go anywhere yeah Absolutely. And systems are bottom line. It was, great. it was a great question. Thank you, Anthony, because if systems are the bottom line key to exiting, mm-hmm. to removing yourself from the business. There are different levels of exit, by the way. You know, you don't have to give yep. away the whole dog and pony show. You remove yourself mm-hmm. operationally, you remove yourself from the board level, and you remain financially, or you remove yourself completely. There are different levels. But the first okay. thing okay. is you have to remove yourself from that operational workflow. You have to elevate yourself above it, and you're not going to do that unless there is something in place, and that doesn't mean more people necessarily. There's not Mm -hmm. something in place which will A, deliver the consistent quality of the experience and B, give you the ability in your higher elevated position within the business to see how it's running, keep that helicopter view and grow and expand it from there. Yeah, because you're selling the business, you're not selling yourself at that point. Correct. Yeah. A business isn't worth everything if it requires you, is it? No. So even if there are people listening who are in a consulting sort of role, there is, you can say, oh, but the business is me. I'm the consultant. You can structure that differently, that your IP, what you teach, how you teach it, all the rest of it, how you consult can be taught to others and you can elevate yourself out of that business and you can exit that business and still retain a portion of it. There, there, are, yeah. there are enough yeah. companies yeah. out there yeah. for which there is a precedent for that. And there are enough mm-hmm. companies out there, big ones who buy boutique consulting companies. Mm. Yeah, that's very interesting insight into how you focus on systems and structures so i think that's um, been good for all our listeners just to think about putting them in place so any business you're building if it's tech or whatever it might be there are all these other things that exist so when we talk to people a lot it's all right let's build the tech and people will come but that's not the way business works you still need a systems you still need people to operate manage support all these other things have to come into play otherwise you can't scale and grow yeah 100 percent. so the last area is making it happen making the magic happen. And this is all about people. So the three things, the three areas of making it happen, you know, who'll do it, who's it for, and, and who says that, is who's on the team, who's your niche. A lot of people call that the target market. 
Personally, I don't know anyone who likes to walk around with a target on their back, but nonetheless. <laughs> yeah, like it. So who, who's on the team and who's your niche and where's the traction? And again, it's, all three are about people. So obviously team. I mentioned the very beginning about hiring based on values and not skills. And to this day, I still do that. You know, you can teach someone something. We recently, in one of the businesses I'm involved with, we recently hired someone for the back end systems and the person didn't have all of the skills that we wanted but they did have uh-huh. the right attitude and they they shared values with us and they had a lot of passion. We're like, done, too easy, right? If uh, your passion is teachable, yeah, when you've got someone that doesn't have energy or get up and go, they're very difficult to teach. Yeah, absolutely. And there were candidates who had more skills than, than this one did. So mm-hmm. but they got the job. So who's on the team? And it's not, it's so values and skills is one side of it. The other side is even if you're a one man band or a three man or a five man, woman, whatever, but if you're one person company or a five person company or whatever, put together your imaginary board, you know, project yourself three down, three years down the track when you're getting point where you might be exiting or looking to exit, maybe start the exit process. And who is your board? Who's on your board then? Firstly, what are the positions and a, and a board, a, you know, a board is, Pretty well, been pretty well defined. So the types of roles you'll need are generically are already out there in the marketplace. And now, who are the people that would be a really good fit? And again, based on the values and the that you share with them, it's sort of like putting the that cla- that mastermind from. Have you, have you ever read Napoleon, Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich, where you put that mastermind together? Yes. Of, yes. You know, mm-hmm. So, so building that in your imagination, or is it building it with people you know, or who you imagine the type of person would be? I start by, by by imagining the personality and the values. Okay, get it. And then start looking, like with the exit strategy, looking around for, for who would fill that in. Yeah. So who mm-hmm. you know, who's out there and who would mm-hmm. be attracted to this? And you might, because when you do it on that basis, as opposed to a paycheck, mm-hmm. it's really interesting to see who can can be attracted to your venture. People may not believe it until they actually go through this themselves. When you define the future board of your business, whether it's going to be in a year or three yes. years or whatever, yes. and you firstly define it based on personality and values, and then you start looking around at who has shared interests and shared values and what sort of personality they are, and you start putting some names onto those seats, and you literally draw a diagram and hang it up. We, you know, we, we'd always hang a, a board table on, on the wall with the seats, and then we'd start putting names in there. Interesting. And, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and it's quite interesting who suddenly gets attracted to your business I'm not suggesting anything ethereal or whatever here. It's just purely mm-hmm. you start putting something out there and you find that people are find your business something they want to be involved with and people that you might think would be outside your budget. And they probably are outside your budget if they just wanted to purely do it for cash. Yeah, I get it. But that's not the only option in this space, is it? It's not because, again, it comes back to what's in it for me and what's in it for me is not just cash. It might be mm. what it says. You know, The bigger question is what does being involved in this business – whether it's in the what's in it for me stage or, you know, who's going to be on my team. It might be about what does it say about me as a person? That's why they might want to get involved. You know, if you're a female only business and and you're out there fighting for women's rights or whatever, or whatever, you know, just to pick up, just to choose that niche, that might yes, be something yes, that yes, a certain yes. type of person really resonates with. Resonates with, like, yeah, get it. Mm. So look at who's going to be on the team. And then that's the board level. And then look at the other areas in the business all the, I don't want to denigrate anybody, it's the lower areas of the great picture of, ech- of echelons and hierarchy, which, which I like to avoid, but you know what I mean by the- I'll get you, yes. Yeah, the less senior roles in the business, they will fill themselves in based on the values later on. But you need to have that st- structure where people, where you were working with people on a day-to-day basis that they are going to help you drive this business to the commercial success you want to have, whether that's through investment or just growing the business, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so who's going to be on your team? Great question to ask and an equally great question to answer early on. Seems One like you thought, think everything, Paul. Everything absolutely. Think, just through this process and it's all three to five years ahead and even down to the team and the personnel is unique in the business. So, yeah, very interesting. Yeah, I guess a lot of people don't really, well, I've, well people like, oh, don't really do that. You know, and again, same thing for the niche. You know, how many companies do you, when you, you have a conversation with someone, whether in a networking event at a pub or in a yes, cafe, yes. and you say, okay, great. Really love talking to you, you know, love what I hear about you online. Tell me, you know, how can I refer people to you? What's really your niche at the moment? What's your avatar? What, or depending on how you want to put it, you know, whether you have a demo, you, whether, whether you go down the demographic route, whether you go down the personality route, what's the basic avatar? And the number of people who cannot give you a straight answer mm. and waffle on is crazy. I think the 
and a realization for us and for me anyway in business is we started a business in pharmacy and we purposely picked the niche because I said, all right, let's target this specific area. It's an area we're working in and let's not go anywhere else and let's serve them. And the amount of opportunity that opens up by picking a niche, I think people get scared about it. And the amount of opportunity, other things that evolve just within that target market, you get to understand them, you get to know them, their thinking, their ins and outs, what the challenges are in industry. It's so much power in terms of delivering to a niche. Yeah. And I always smile when someone says, yes, but our product or our service is, is suited to everybody. Everybody, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Heard that before. Even the Catholic, <laughs> yeah, even the Catholic church doesn't have 100% yes. of the religion market. Right? <laughs> no sure. church does. So obviously it doesn't suit everybody. Not that you complain if you had the number of followers that any of the major league churches have. But <laughs> your niche is your ability to define very clearly who you are adding value to. Now imagine, just again, to put this back for a moment in the perspective of talking to an investor and now yes. you be the investor, you're pitching yourself about this business and they and you say, hey, who's going to buy this stuff? Who wants this stuff? And the person in front of you starts to hum and ha and not really have a direct answer, but tries to talk around it and instead mm -hmm. of giving you a 30-second succinct description, which you can then yes. question and yes. they would embellish upon, they occupy the next five minutes of your life that you'll never get back <laughs> telling you nothing. <laughs> Going around in circles, basically. Yes. Yeah. Get that. Yep. I know I don't endear myself to a lot of people by the way I speak, but, you know, it's... Oh, it's telling it straight, and I think it's brilliant the way you, you present it because it is, it's straight and to the point, and there's a lot of clarity around this if you really dig into this content and there's a, like a fire hose going off at the moment of so much content here and so much gold and i think i think people need to listen to this episode a couple of times just to get their head around what you're trying to say here but it is all about structures thinking it all through really getting down into the detail and i'm sure market research comes into this significantly especially at the start mm, it does you know bottom line is this i we i talked about large numbers before but yes. let's say you're an investor Let's say that even on a small scale, even on 10 grand, someone comes to you and you're going to be syndicating with a whole bunch of people to put a total of 100K or 150K or 250K into a business. And yours, your contribution is 10 grand or 25 grand, whatever you can either, you either have in the bank and drag out of your super or drag out of your credit card because you think this is a really good opportunity. Mm -hmm. What critical questions are you going to ask, removing all the emotion from how much you might love this business? What critical questions are you going to ask? And you're going to find, you're going to be asking the same questions I'm talking about now and a lot more. And, you know, we've got a due diligence list that goes you know, a mile long, but mm -hmm. you're going to ask those critical questions. So why are you not asking those critical questions of your own business? And therein lies the flaw with many business people that walk into business because I think they fall in love with the concept of being a business owner. I think I did early days. It's like when you start, like, oh, good business, let's, let's run this. But when you really dig in, I think um, what you're saying here is just puts people back and just before you're jumping in, think of yourself as an investor, not a business owner or an employee within that business or however you want to sit it. You're investing time, money, effort, sweat equity, whatever it is. So technically you are an investor and maybe the first one within the business. So yeah, we should be answering this question to ourselves before we just get sold on an idea or a dream. Yeah, spot on. You're absolutely spot on because you are an investor. Just imagine that you're in a you're, you're going to start a business and your let's say that your earning capability is anywhere from 150 to 300k a year, right? Yes. Let's just say that if you were to go into corporate, that, that would be you know, with OTE or whatever and other bonuses that maybe any maybe even more. I'm I'm just trying to pick a middle road here, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're going to go into business and in corporate, you could do that. You could have, work nine to five, grab a paycheck, go home, do your tax return at the end of the year, be happy. Have your weekends to yourself. Mm -hmm. And now you're going to go into business and you're not going to have that same lifestyle because why? Clearly, you want to be setting yourself up for a bigger outcome or a bigger purpose that you're trying to serve and solve and problem. And the why comes yeah, into why. that, I would say. Mm. Absolutely, right? So I'm not yeah. saying from the yeah. beginning you need to yeah. make to replace that one that income one-to-one. And indeed, the, it's the probably impossible money. from the beginning unless you've got this massive amount of funding and you start selling. Like even in terms of you get investment, you can't use that to replace a paycheck. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> <laughs> I think that a lot of people think that I'll take, I'll get a half a million dollars investment and I'll use that to pay myself two fifty per annum. No. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
that's a good point. And thank you for raising that because that's just one of those things that comes I've up all the time. Before. It comes up in my world too. It's like, what are you talking about? Investors are not going to so give you money to pay yourself. Forget about it. You'd like a we million. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you'd like a million bucks so that we can we can firstly pay off that director's loan and then uh, yeah, don't think so. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> So last one, so we have, who's on the team, who's the niche, and where's the traction? So traction can be a number of things. Uh, as I said in the yeah. beginning, one of the things we, I say to people all the time is, hey, you, you want funding, you're looking for 100 grand, 200 grand, you know, you'd probably settle for 50 grand if I, could, if I gave it to you. Um, why don't you just go and sell yourself out of your funding issues? That's one. So track, okay. traction can yeah. be sales. It can be not just Volume is not it's not necessarily volume of sales because you may be selling high ticket items and selling making one sale of fifty grand does not give you mm-hmm. traction. Selling a that's thousand, a thousand at five dollars is actually more traction than one at fifty grand. I like that. Yeah, yeah. that's very interesting because you got a thousand people that say this is good, not just one. Yeah, I should have I should have said fifty dollars. Sorry, <laughs> I'm usually good with that's numbers, okay. but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, I've got the you point because you got a thousand. Yeah. So now you've got a database of a thousand people who've already bought from you at some level. You can go and sell them the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. So traction can be sales. It can be loyal community. It can be social media following provided they're engaged and provide you have a way of demonstrating that engagement. It can be your analytics on your website. And I don't just mean Google analytics. I mean analytics, which shows people taking a journey through your website, how they go through. So you can demonstrate the marketing you're putting out there is actually mm-hmm. having an effect because it's driving that, you know, you have a theory about how you want to drive people through and then the mar- the analytics demonstrates that, that your theories are correct. It yep. can be the people you would you attract to your advisory board. It could be investment that's been put in, which is not through the, you know, the so-called three Fs, right? Yes. Which are family, f- friends and... What's yes. the last one? The kind way of saying Codes. it is fools. <laughs> what was that? Sorry? Oh, missed you. You dropped out it's for a touch there. Oh, sorry. I said, yeah, family, friends, and the kind way of saying it is fools. Mm-hmm. There's a less kind way of saying it, which I, I won't repeat right now. Yes, <laughs> but, yeah. that's fine. I get it. Yeah. But yeah, you can't count the three Fs as investment to demonstrate traction or anything really because they just, okay. they're just they putting money into you because they love you. The contradiction to that is if you go and do a, a crowdfunding campaign mm-hmm. where you have a high volume of people actually buying into it, that yes. creates traction in two ways, depending upon also depending upon whether it's a marketing crowdfunding or a an equity crowdfunding basis. People are investing their money in the business or they're buying the product. So yeah, there are, uh, and the other, another way of getting traction is, uh, or demonstrating traction, I should say, is mm-hmm. um, your reputation in the marketplace, whether it's through the media, whether it's through yes. reviews, yes. all those sorts of things. So when you're when you look talking to an investor, these are the things they'd be looking at. And again, okay. Okay. how you know, you're, you're the business owner, how do you measure whether you're actually getting traction? What is traction? You know, rubber hits the road. You're getting grip and moving forward more rapidly. These are the things that will help you get forward mm-hmm. faster. So putting a system around measuring traction is also something I would imagine that you do. Absolutely. Yeah. If, if you can't measure it, you can't really demonstrate it apart from, you know, point to some big numbers, but it's, it's great yeah. to point yeah. to some numbers. Mm-hmm. It's even better to point to the numbers and say, this is how we arrived at it. Yes. yes. Because the yes. message you're sending to, a, a, to an investor is, I really know my stuff and I've really thought about it. And if you know your stuff and you really thought about it and you can demonstrate it to an investor, wow, imagine what you can do in your own mind. Yeah, then it's evidence-based. Yes. <laughs> oh, in terms yeah. of when we sell ourselves, there's more power too. Yeah. I mean, ultimately... You're sitting there on the on the on the kitchen or the, the dining room table on a Friday afternoon, about to have dinner or whatever, and you're thinking, business really working. There's money in the bank and all the rest of it. And the, there'll be the different groups. There'll be the groups who sit there and think, I don't really know. I can see money in the bank and you know, we, yeah. we sort of we, we tick over and I've got some employees and they build themselves up that way. And yeah. they sort of, it's, they may be correct. They may be completely deluding themselves, but they may be correct. And then there are the people who have their stuff together and they're like Wow, I've got a fantastic business. Mm-hmm. Like I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm looking at the revenue. Yeah, okay, we can do more, but I know how we can do more. I can see that the last campaign we did, we got X amount, what X percent conversion rate. We converted a whole bunch of new clients. We upgraded a whole bunch of old clients. Our our spend was whatever it wasn't, and you know the cost of of acquiring new business was twenty percent, thirty percent, whatever it was. They they mm-hmm. know their numbers, right? 
They know their numbers. Every business can be brought down, in my opinion, there are multiple ways of doing it. One way of, of defining what a business is outside of why and purpose and soul and all that sort of good stuff is numbers. They don't yes. lie. Yes. They really don't lie. And every business is simply a bunch of processes put together, executed really, really well. And yes. what we're doing in business is we're creating, irrespective of whether you're selling a product or a service, what we're doing in every business is we're creating experiences. And I, I mm -hmm. throw any business at me, I'll tell you how it creates an experience or how it should be creating an experience. And okay. that's where it matters because people don't care. And this is the bottom mm -hmm. line of the whole thing. You can have a really big why. And I believe personally, it's great to have a why. I won't say it's essential, but I believe it's great to have a why in business, a purpose. There are enough businesses out there without, who are void of purpose, <laughs> void of why, but they make money. So it's not necessary, not necessary. but, I, yeah. no, okay. but I do find it, a, I find it mm -hmm. a good thing to have. People won't like me for saying this, but quite frankly, what you do, no one gives a rat's about. There are. <laughs> about you, is it? No, when I go and buy something, it's more about me. Let's be honest. Yeah, it's yeah. totally right. And there are a million other people out there who do what you do. And maybe not a million, but there are a bloody lot of people out there. Oh, there's competition everywhere. Mm -hmm. Just be willing to look and you'll find plenty of it. Yeah. And as soon as you think you've had an original idea, Google it and then see the 10,000 <laughs> other people had it before you. Yeah. Correct. It's never original. No. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Execution is all that counts. And I think you've told us what we really need to be focusing here on. Yeah. So you've got why and you've got what. And what's in the middle is how. We are Homo sapiens species. We are human beings and it, life is nothing more than a process of experiences. That is, and, and again, you know, sorry, touchy-feely gone. Bring it down to some really clinical stuff. That is what life is. It's a process of experiences. How you do what you do is all about the experience. It's what keeps people coming back. Mm -hmm. Why you do what you do, that'll keep, that'll bring people to the door. It'll be like, my gosh, they, they, they're a really cool company. They care about this. They care about that. It may get them to, to the first transaction. It may not. It'll yes. certainly get yes. them to the door by whatever widget that every other person down the, down the street sells as well. How you go about selling them, how you go about engaging with them, that is what is going to create an experience. That is what is going to keep them coming. You're spending more, more often, mm -hmm. and telling other people to do the same thing with you, how you do what you do. We, you know, People talk about CRM, the customer relationship management. I've been around CRM since year yes. dot. We've abolished the concept of customer relationship management in any of our businesses. Because it's like not about managing, it's, mm -hmm. for us, it's not about managing a relationship. Uh, uh -huh. We find that quite arrogant. For us, <laughs> again, I'm, I'm not endearing myself to a certain <laughs> sector of the industry. But for us, every interaction you have with prospect or a client, whether it's mm -hmm. an email, whether it's a face-to-face, -face, whether it's a phone call, whether it's a chat or whatever it is, social, every interaction you have is another opportunity for you to recreate your relationship. So you are in the business of, in that context, and the business of recreating, constantly recreating the relationship. It's sort of like a restaurant is only as good as its last meal and a rock or pop star is only as good as their last song. The next song comes out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't like that one. Okay, I'm off to find the next next and best artist to listen to. Didn't like that last steak. Oh, there's a new steak restaurant down the road. Let's give them a try next time as opposed to being dedicated to going back there. You know, there was an Italian restaurant in Den Haag when I was living there. They made the most phenomenal fresh pasta with uh, foie gras, carpaccio, truffle sauce. No one else did it. And I would always go back. And to the day that they closed shop, they always made it phenomenal. Uh -huh. And I would tell everyone about it. So that ex always recreating that experience and that relationship. So I think I've been... Uh Paul, oh, I've got so much content out of this, and I think I've learned a lot just sitting back listening to you. Clearly, a lot of experience behind you, and um, I think, uh, yeah, I'll take quite a bit away from this conversation, and I'm sure all our listeners will. Definitely. In terms of who you are and just the way you structure a business and the way you think about it is quite simplistic, but there's obviously a lot there. There's a lot of detail behind it and a lot of thinking and brain power put in it to get you to a point of even beginning. And I think today's conversation was around setting up a business to yeah, basically exit. And just to give a few tips to the people at home that are listening to this, that are maybe in a business that is operating or maybe in an idea stage where they're looking to build some tech or doing something in that particular realm. How long would you dedicate to going through these nine points working on these before you even put any investment into a business? What would you generally do? Do you mean us as an entity or a person to, who's listening to this for their own business? Either, either way, if I'm listening to this, just let's start at the person listening to this that's non-tech founder, ready to put some equity into a business or put some time into it. What should they be doing? Because this is all prep work. 
Oh, it's all my pre-thinking. How long should I be investing in pre-thinking around a business? The short answer is one day is enough to get all this on. If you dedicate yes. one day without distraction of anything, uh-huh. you can get yes. a blueprint mm-hmm. on a page, which is enough to start you going. And then you just mm-hmm. fill it in as you go. And I'll give you... Iterate. Iterate. Yeah, correct. It's, it is a sequence of iterations. Okay. It's sort of like before that CRM we were talking about came about, I would have a 20-page document that I had all okay. these questions okay. on printed out and in a lever arch file. And when I met people, yes, I would yes. write what I knew about them. And as I grew to know them more through however, whatever means, I'd add to that. So I didn't need to know the full picture first before yes. I would start yes. interacting with them. And it's the same here. Get your initial thoughts out. And on a paper, don't just sort of think about them because you're not going to hold them in your head. Get them onto that's a fair paper point. Either. Yeah, get them onto paper. Get them out. I think that's a fair point because you can think about things and they get lost if you don't get them down paper. Yeah, totally. So as a minimum, pixels on a screen. In yeah. the initial brainstorming, though, I'd really suggest to people to use a pen and a piece of paper and just mind map on a piece of paper before you put into pixels on a screen. There's a, there's this thing that happens between yes. writing something or drawing something and in the brain in terms of memory and, and creativity and mm-hmm. and development of ideas that you don't get when you're just typing. At some point, yeah, put it into a document on a, on a computer. Okay. And then, again, like you were saying, iterate, iterate, mm-hmm. iterate, and refine as you go. But don't mm-hmm. procrastinate. Perfectionism yes. is yes. procrastination. <laughs> you are not sure. it. <laughs> I love that. You yeah. will not get it perfect. I do not uh-huh. care who you are. Uh-huh. You will not get it perfect. Well, there's no such thing as perfect, is there? And in yeah, business, yeah. like you said, I think during this conversation, it's going to evolve and you need to be fluid enough to be able to evolve. And having this blueprint, yes, needs to evolve with you too. Yeah. I mean, Burger King or Hungry Jacks or McDonald's don't make the best hamburger. No. But they have a system <laughs> and they, you know, they start out. Yeah. Qantas. You know, you know we get every single time you go there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Pick a business, they're not the best in what they do. They're just really good. Yeah. And they're good enough. It has to be yeah, good yeah. enough to start and just start. Mm-hmm. I'd rather see people starting and they're, like you were saying, iterating on it. Mm-hmm. And then rather than sitting back and saying, oh, well, you know, I've got to get this bit right. I haven't worked that bit out. Yes. No, you don't. <laughs> get these nine points down. Yep. I'll give you a real simple way to ask these questions of yourself and get it sort of solidified. It was taught okay. to me by an Aussie back in okay. Dusseldorf in, in Dusseldorf back in the eighties. And the, the technique is real simple. You ask the question, mm-hmm. you answer the question, and then you question the answer. And you write this down. You don't type this on the screen, you write it on a piece of paper. Right? You can do it on the screen, but it's not as effective as we said. You ask the question, you answer the question, you question the answer, and you keep doing that until the answer you see on the page in front of you does not want to make you cringe or puke. Love it. <laughs> right? And what and what that what I mean by that is it resonates and you feel like yeah that you're connected with it as opposed to you know when you're faking it's, it. It's not from mind, it's from deep within. It's saying, yeah, it's not just your head. It's not the brain. It's like coming maybe a bit from heart, if I would say it from that perspective. Hmm. You know, and what's in it for me? So answer yeah. the question. Uh-huh. Uh where's the exit? And you might reach a block say, I just don't know anymore. Okay. Here, if you don't know anymore, think of something crazy. I guess <laughs> Think of something so crazy for your context, crazy. Yes, and just put that on paper as an initial thing. It might you might end up discarding it later on, okay. and at some point you want to obviously stop. But spend a day, night, you know, take a nine hour day, one hour on each, and you'll get the answers, and you'll have something phenomenal to start with. Paul, this has been uh, very insightful, and I, I know a lot of our listeners will get a hell of a load out of this if they're willing to invest the time. And you've only said nine hours there to begin with, and. That was a lot less than I thought you were going to say. So, yeah, that's pretty cool to see your perspective on it and just getting moving and getting starting and getting into action. So really appreciate you coming on the DevReady podcast. It's been a very different podcast for us, looking really deep within business, business structures. From the perspective of uh, an investor, a long-term business person that's been doing this for a hell of a long time in all different categories. So really appreciate your time, Paul. And um, how can people reach out? Because I know you do some mentoring and bits and pieces in this space. If anyone wants to get to know Paul and deep dive within their business with you, how might they do that? Either via my website, so paullanger.com.au or go on to LinkedIn. Pretty much on most social profiles, you'll find me forward slash Paul J. Langer, P-A-U-L-J-L-A-N-G-E. 
Right. So whether it's Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, that's yeah, all the time. I've, yeah, I've, I've dominated, the, yeah, I've dominated that namespace. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty responsible to all those. The website's the easiest or just info at paullanger.com.au if you want to send me a direct email. Paul, absolute pleasure. Really appreciate once again sharing your domain knowledge and definitely helping even my perspective. I learned a lot today. So I really appreciate it. Thank you both for having me on. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. It was an absolute pleasure. Oh, thanks a lot.